so good morning everyone we are uh, <clears throat> uh welcome to our course and good morning and uh, uh most of the classes which we'll have henceforth will be basically run by najam sir and me because we've had a lot of guests but now we have our own things to tell you so i would be focusing more on stars because that's what i basically deal with and uh, <clears throat> sir will follow stats as well as galaxies which you can see in the upcoming program list tomorrow we have a presentation by one of the participants uh, which is on stellar occultations which we'll have at the beginning followed by a, a talk on statistics but we have quite a few sessions on statistics because that's very important for analysis right <clears throat> so today i'll start talking about hertzsprung russell diagram this is the holy grail of stellar astrophysics so if you actually understand the hertzsprung russell diagram today would be a more theory oriented kind of a talk but this will be followed by actually doing hertzsprung russell diagram essentially with gaia data i will also show you how to do it with two mass data as well as other kinds of data and uh, uh you'll you'll understand why is the hertzsprung russell diagram so important in stellar astrophysics <clears throat> so uh this is actually an old slide i have which often is nice for kids and uh, maybe many of you all may be of the um, age group either who saw lion came themselves or who had kids who watched it like in my case so you have this conversation between timon and pumba where pumba has timon ever wonder what those sparkly dots up there are pumba says i want i don't wonder i know what are they they are fire flies that got stuck up in that blueish black thing and uh, to quite an extent what timon says is kind of true because uh, sorry it's they are fire flies but uh, uh but actually you know they 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 do have fire in them and uh, let's try to see in what sense is that the case this is also another nice uh, quote which i have which is a quote from um, akaberry film this is for the uh, probably uh, <clears throat> the more romantic kinds where it's lovely to live on a raft we had the sky up there all speckled with stars and we used to lay on our backs and look at them and discuss about whether they was made or whether they just happened right jim he allowed they was made but i allowed they happened i judged that it would take too long to make so many so uh, obviously the question about star formation has been something that has always intrigued people for a very long time and uh, we'll see what are the modern day understandings that we have to it in today's times <clears throat> so what is a star a star is basically a big ball of gas with fusion going on at its center held together by gravity and what we'll actually talk about also today is that the different kinds of stars right you have massive stars you have low mass stars and actually the kind of fusion processes that take place in stars of different masses are different right so massive stars they end up with much larger temperatures at their core and that's why the kind of fusion reactions they have at the core is very different from the kind of fusion reactions we have in low mass stars the sun is a star somewhere in between it's neither too massive it's neither too low mass it's like the goldilocks in between and uh, <clears throat> we'll see how do nuclear processes take place on the sun itself too so what is a star a star is basically a fusion reactor and what is a fusion reactor a fusion reactor is what you see on the right over here is you basically have lighter atoms these are hydrogen atoms these are isotopes of hydrogen deuterium and tritium and what they do is that they can fuse together to actually give you helium so here what you have is you have low mass uh, nuclei which are actually fusing together to give you a higher mass thing which is helium and the difference in energy between this end product and the initial products is what we call the mass defect and if you multiply the mass defect by c squared you actually get what is called the binding energy which is the energy which binds this um, helium atom together right so essentially this is the kind of energy you would need to provide to the helium atom if you want to break it down to lighter atoms if you want to reverse this process then to the helium atom i need to provide this amount of binding energy so that it goes back into this uh, chain right i would also like to bring to your notice that uh, what we basically have in nuclear energy sources on the earth for example these are essentially fission reactors 
And what we actually do in fission is we actually take heavy atoms, like you take uranium-238, et cetera. You take essentially heavy atoms, and these are unstable atoms. And therefore, when they actually um, uh, decay, you actually get lighter atoms. And with that, you get this excess energy. So in this case, we'll actually, I'll show you the binding energy curve. The binding energy curve falls like this. So you actually need, even for fusion, you will end up, so in, in, for, in principle, for fusion, you have to, uh, uh, you know, you're generating energy. Similarly, in fission, also you generate energy because you break this bigger atom into smaller component atoms, right? And the binding energy uh, the, gives you the mass effect. What are the properties of stars that you notice? I understand that a little bit of this is a recap of what we've already done in the past, but I would like to just make some of these concepts clear once again, because we'll be using them the next week when we actually do color magnitude diagrams. So uh, what are the two things which you actually see in stars? The first thing you actually see is the difference in brightness, and you also see the difference in colors, right? So both of them have a certain piece of information, and both these pieces of information are actually what are the important components in a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So what is brightness? Brightness is luminosity, right? Now we know that uh, you have stars of various sizes and colors, right? For example, here I have a set of different stars. You have uh, Wolf 359, which is that small. You have the sun. And then you have the, the sun has a size of 1.5 million kilometers. That's the diameter of the sun. And then you have Sirius. This is the next brightest star in our sky, which you can see. This is in Canis Major. You can see it's much, much larger than the sun. And if I were to make, if I were to scale Sirius to be this size, then I'll have a whole bunch of other stars which are much larger than Sirius, for example. If I were to rescale with Aldebaran with this size, I'll have these ones. Betelgeuse is a very exciting star. There's lots happening about Betelgeuse nowadays, the dimming of Betelgeuse, etc. Uh, and uh, and then if you scale up Betelgeuse, you'll get this and you get this. So in short, you have a very dry, wide range of sizes of stars. Now, why are sizes of stars important? We'll talk about that in a bit. The next thing is the color. You can clearly see in this image, you can see certain stars which more, look more yellow, look more red, look more blue, right? There's a clear color indicator which you can see in them. And... Uh, the color indicator is also an important thing. Now, in stellar astrophysics, there in the theory of stellar structure, okay, there is what is called the Russell-Watt theorem. The Russell-Watt theorem states that the two important uh, parameters for a star in terms of theoretical stellar structure equations are mass and chemical composition, right? We won't go into details about those equations. You can find them in any regular book on stellar structure. And... Uh, the, so essentially, these are the two important parameters for stars as per the Russell-Watt theorem. And these can be mapped to two, more, two parameters, which are luminosity and temperature, of which you make the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram has temperature on the x-axis and luminosity on the y-axis, which are, uh, uh, to quite an extent, a direct reflection of the mass and the chemical composition that we were talking about. So uh, <clears throat> essentially, the difference between the Russell-Watt theorem and Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is Hertzsprung-Russell diagram plots parameters which you observe. You observe luminosity and temperature. But in terms of equations, if you were to write equations of stellar structure, then the parameters that would come into those equations would be mass and chemical composition, right? So let us now talk about what is the HR diagram and uh, how do we have, I've already mentioned it over here, you know the thing, that it is luminosity and temperature, which are the two important factors which are going to be plotted in the HR diagram, right? So let us see what is this HR diagram and how do stars behave on the diagram and what is it, how do stars evolve in the HR diagram and what makes the HR diagram so very important in stellar astrophysics. Now, this is also, uh, I'm sorry, some of these slides of here are more outreachy, more chatty type, but I thought it was it would be nice to get a bit relaxed today and uh, relax your mind so that you understand the concept which I want to convey. Now, uh, what is the basic problem, right? For example, if you had a mosquito 
who looks at a bunch of people over here sitting in a stadium and the mosquito tries to understand human life right so uh, you can see I'll, i'll just show you the comparison how would the mosquito actually try to understand human life it's not a very easy problem and what we are doing in our case with our lifetimes etc if we are trying to understand the life of a star it is even tougher than this problem which we are talking about the mosquito because here i can show it to you that a human life in principle is about 3000 mosquito lives okay i've written the numbers for males and female mosquitoes but let's take an average let's say human beings live for 80 days then approximately you have uh, 3000 mosquito lives is what we live but if you were to compare that to a stellar life okay if the star can actually live from a million years to a billion years to 10 billion years for example the sun has a lifetime of 10 billion years right so even if you give uh, if it's 10 billion years you have 10 part 10 you give yourself 100 years to live so it's 10 part 8 right so 10 part 8 to 10 part 9 that's the kind of comparison which we have in the ratio of the lifetime of human beings and stars right compared to for example the mosquito life with human life so for the mosquito it would be far easier to actually uh, track human life compared to human beings doing that for stars right so uh, we obviously cannot sit back and watch look at a star being born and see how it evolves we cannot do that we have to just look at the sample of stars we have and use the laws of physics to try to understand what's actually happening right because you cannot live through the lifetime of a star to actually see the processes it's going through right so this is the kind of problem we are facing so uh, like i said so let's say the mosquito takes up a certain approach right the mosquito observes properties for each person for example color of hair height weight age age is a difficult factor the mosquito may not know that so the mosquito knows color height weight, weight no not necessarily age right and a bit depending on that the mosquito can ask itself the following questions what are the major properties that define human life cycle what do we notice notice in people when we want to assess for example the age right so how do we actually do that so if i were to draw a human hr diagram so what do i do this is comparable to what we are doing it for stars you are seeing a whole set of people a very large number of people and let's say the two important factors we have observables of human beings are their height and their weight okay let's just take these as of now and if i were to make a plot okay of height versus weight for human beings you would see a plot something like this right so if i have this sample of human beings a large sample i can see there are some of them which have a height less than a meter right less than 1 and 1/2 meters etc you have this kind of a height a lower height but they also have a lesser weight right and this is what we call children right so children have a lower height a lesser weight and they fall into this region while the bulk of people fall into this region which is the region between b and c which is a height of about somewhere between 1 and 1/2 to 2 meters and a range of weight ranging from say 40 km kilo kilograms to 80 kg right so this is the the bulk of human beings if you were to just go to a marketplace for example this is the where the bulk of human beings will fall in this region some amount of the observed people would be here which we'd call children right but the bulk of it is over here so therefore what does that indicate to you that the bulk of human life is spent in this region because most human beings which you observe they seem to be sitting in this region that is the density of points i have in this region is much larger than the density of points i have in this region right so most of these are all sitting over here right and this is what i would call adulthood right so you could say that most people live through some kind of adulthood from say the age 18 to maybe 60 70 80 after which you could again have a fall in the sense the height may also reduce as well as the weight may reduce right not necessary but you can have some amount of points in this region also with but they, that will come again here that will come over here which would be lesser height and lesser weight right so some of these points over here which you can see these could also belong to older people 
that is uh, people after a certain age whose height may also reduce as well as their weight may reduce so it could be over here so this region actually has children as well as some amount of old elder people while here you have what is called adulthood right so basically a plot of this kind gives you an estimate of how much time of a human lifetime is spent in this region of adulthood which you have over here right and uh, <clears throat> so let us go ahead so we we said that the russell watt theorem gives us mass and chemical composition hr diagram gives us luminosity and temperature so what we what we did over here is we actually see that if we plot these two parameters height and weight these are important parameters in defining um, humans right so actually if you now think if you actually see a person you are basically looking at their height and weight and that's what you're using to estimate their age right if you see somebody who's like half a, a you know 3 feet you'll obviously they say that's a kid right that's a child and you are actually using this height weight parameter in defining ages right so age is a indirect indicator which you are getting from the height weight diagram it doesn't come there but it's an indicator it, it comes indirectly right and then you may also come to the conclusion that other factors for example color of hair length of hair color of eyes uh, color of skin etc are not important parameters in defining this hr diagram right so they don't play an important role in this thing right now the important thing is what are the important parameters in stars right like we doing it for human lives what is it important in stars right so <clears throat> if you want to do that that was uh, that was actually done by individually by hertzsprung and russell they individually group worked together and came to these the conclusion that these two important quantities about a star is its absolute brightness and its temperature and these two factors are the ones which uh, also appear in the terms of mass and chemical composition in stellar structure right to actually tell you what is the structure of these stars so i'll just repeat this thing this was done earlier with you all i know that when we did astronomy basics but i'll just repeat it so if for the brightness of stars we have a scale called the magnitude scale and the magnitude scale is used to describe brightness in such a way that five magnitudes correspond to a factor of 100 in brightness so if two stars differ by a factor of 100 in brightness we say in the magnitude scale it varies by 5 so it's actually 2.512 into 2.152 into 2.152 to the power of 5 which will give you a 100 right so uh, that that is the kind of factor which you have in terms of intensity so uh, if you actually have two stars which have arbitrary magnitudes b and a you can actually write it that the intensity of light coming from each of them varies as this 2.512 to the power of mb minus ma where mb and ma are the magnitudes of these two stars right now uh, we also spoke about so these this would be what we called apparent magnitude this is the magnitude of stars which you see when you are observing them right so that is what is apparent to you but we also know that a very important factor in brightness is the factor of distance right so the simplest method which we use in astronomy to actually get distances is parallax parallax is what we also use all the time with our eyes right we have a bifocal vision right so when you're looking at an object you're actually looking at it with both your eyes you see the angle it subtends and based on that your brain estimates the distance to that object right uh, you can try this out that if you close an eye and you have a finger and you try to catch the tip of your finger it's actually difficult to catch it because you do not know the depth right you are not getting this distance information because one eye is closed so you need bifocal vision to actually estimate distances right so <clears throat> here i have actually shown you this parallax thing where we actually using it now in astronomy what do we do we know the earth goes around the sun and this distance is one astronomical unit 150 million kilometers and therefore if i observe a star today for example uh, over here in a certain direction and then exactly after 6 months when i come out to this size then i again observe the star i get an angle this angle will be twice the parallax i define half the angle to be a parallax and this is called an astronomical unit 
so we are going to be using this uh, in the next class that the the parallax right the, so so this angle of parallax is defined as the angle which you get when you subtend it is it is one half second which is the angle you'd subtend if you had a baseline of one astronomical unit uh, sorry so I, I just think this is for one astronomical unit but now we take this that the, the 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 angle of one arc second is the angle you'll get if the um, if the uh, we get the distance in parsecs, right? So a parsec is exactly the distance at which you would get the um, what do you say? You will get the uh, the parallax angle, right? In arc seconds. So we'll be next time talking about Gaia data, where you'll constantly see your parallax is given in. Uh, arc seconds or billy arc seconds and you will all the time take distance as one upon p right and that is the way you will define the distance to stars right so uh, gaia we'll talk about that next time actually measures the parallax to stars and that is used as the distance indicator right but this is the basic concept behind parallax that you've got to take distance is one upon p so whatever is your p value you take that the inverse of it and that will give you the distance I have another repeat over here for parallax is the apparent change in the position of a star as the observer changes the motion, right? So we can actually get this angle and the distance would be one parsec. So we already spoke about light years, but the unit which is used more in astronomy, we will see in astronomy papers, etc. We always use the unit of parsecs because parsecs actually deals with the parallax angle, right? We do not deal with light years generally. We talk about distances more in terms of parsecs, okay? Now, why do we need that distance? Is because we uh, spoke about apparent magnitude and apparent magnitude has to be converted to what is called absolute magnitude. That is the, the brightness of a star if it was a fixed distance of 10 parsecs, okay? So if the star is at a fixed distance of 10 parsecs, the magnitude you get for the star is what it's called, it's absolute magnitude, right? And the absolute magnitude is the factor which actually comes in the HR diagram, right? So this is the apparent magnitude. You can see that it can be quite um, uh, deceptive in the sense that the apparent magnitude of the sun is minus 26. It's so, so bright. The full moon is minus 13. You have all these other these things, but if you were to actually convert it to uh, absolute magnitudes, you would actually have a big change. So these are all the apparent magnitudes. And like I said, absolute magnitude is the brightness of the star if it was at fixed distance of 10 parsecs. And uh, that would give you the absolute magnitude. <clears throat> so this formula, I think we had done it when we did uh, uh, when we did the part on astronomy basics. Small m is the apparent magnitude. Big M is the absolute magnitude. And from this very equation which we have, right? MB minus MA is equal to 2.5 times log of LA by LB. If you replace this with apparent and this one with absolute, right, you will actually get the same equation. And only over here, your luminosity will vary as one upon D squared, right? And my D is 10 parsecs, right? So log of 10 is one. And therefore, you have your 10 squared. So that goes gets multiplied into 2.5, which gives you a five. And therefore, you get this equation, which is over here that m minus m is equal to minus five times plus five log d, right? And uh, so this is the apparent, this is the absolute. So if I have the distance, note that we need to have the distance in parsecs, right? So if I have the distance in parsecs, if I put it as 10, you'll get minus five plus five, which is zero. That is the apparent magnitude is the absolute magnitude, right? So they are equal at 10 parsecs. While if you have a distance of less than 10 parsecs, then the apparent will be lesser than this. It will be greater than this, this. Please note that a magnitude scale is a reverse scale in the sense a lesser number indicates a brighter object, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so we also define something called distance modulus. I want you all to note this also because this will be used when we do the analysis later on. You will need to know the distance modulus of objects, right? The other important thing which we are going to talk about next week when we go on to Gaia data is we'll be talking about stellar velocities, right? Now, we know that when we look at stars, we are actually seeing a 2D projection of a 3D universe, 
right? The star is at some distance, it's moving with some velocity, but in the sky, we are seeing this projection on the plane of the sky, right? And therefore, what are the velocities we observe? One is the radial velocity, right? That is along the line of sight, which is perpendicular to the plane of sky. Okay, that's the radial velocity. And that we will get basically through spectroscopic measurements, right? You have to do spectroscopic measurements and uh, you will actually uh, get the Doppler shift of the spectral lines from which you can get the radial velocity, right? The other kind of velocity which we actually do is uh, we actually, we've spoken about that earlier, that stellar coordinates are RA and DEC. And if there's a movement of the star, for example, you observe a star today and you compare it with the observations of the star, say, 100 years ago. So your baseline is 100 years and you see a shift in the RAN deck of the star. Obviously, you have to correct it for precession, mutation, all the other effects which are taking place. If you correct it with all of that and you still get a motion, then that is what is called the proper motion, right? So proper motion, if you see, like we'll see that Next time in the Gaia catalog, it's resolved in RA as well as in DEC. Okay. So using that, you can actually get the proper motion in RA, proper motion in DEC. And from that, you can get the actual velocity, which is there in the plane of sky. Okay. So this is in the plane of sky, which is here. And then if you actually use these two velocities, your radial velocity and this tangential velocity, take the sum of the square, the root of the sum of the squares, you will get the space velocity. You will get to know how is a particular star moving, right? And that's what we actually do with the data which we get. We actually try to get the space velocity of the star. Why do we want to do that? Is we want to know how are stars moving in different parts of the galaxy, right? So we, we actually seeing that. And that's what we are going to do. <clears throat> Now, coming back to luminosity, uh, what is luminosity? Luminosity over here, like I've defined it down here, you actually you use Stephen Boltzmann's law, which actually says that the amount of radiation you're getting from an object of a temperature T is sigma T power 4, right? And uh, if the this is for unit area, if the object has a certain area A, supposing it's a sphere, we take the area to be 4 pi r squared, then my luminosity is 4 pi r squared into sigma t power 4. So luminosity, right, which is there in the HR diagram, it carries both these two components of information. It carries the radius of the star as well as the temperature of the star. Both these uh, components, both these parameters are sitting in the luminosity information, right? Okay. Now, how do we basically get the temperature of a star, right? Uh, so how do we do that? The simplest way is we assume the star is a black body radiator. Why? Because we have Planck's radiation law, right, for black bodies. And that's what we would like to do. So let's say, for example, we have a star, right? So, you know, uh, everybody is aware of this, the electromagnetic spectrum. This is the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is this range from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, right? Uh, but you also have the other parts of the spectrum, which are gamma rays, X-rays, microwaves, radio waves, etc. Uh, <clears throat> you could be observing the star stellar emission in different wavelengths, right? Now, so what we basically do is here I have the simple example of the prism where you have light from a star falling on the prism. And then what happens in the prism is what is called dispersion, right? You have a different refractive index for different wavelengths due to which you actually get the spectrum. By getting the spectrum, you will see the brightness it's giving in different wavelengths, right? So the spectrum of the star in this case is done with a prism, but you could do it with various other things. For example, they are done with gratings. In uh, typical uh, telescopes, they are done with gratings and prisms as a mixture. It's called grisms. And there are various other uh, spectral um, you know, components in the spectrometer which are used to get the spectrum of the light. What are you getting by the spectrum of the light? You are getting the distribution of en energies for different wavelengths. So let's see over here, this is the uh, spectrum of light, for example, here, which I'm putting. You could look at an object and you, at different wavelengths, you measure the intensity, right? So I get a different intensity at different wavelengths, okay? 
Now you can see that this actually, uh, look, this is a typical black body spectrum. These are black body spectrums for 12,000 Kelvin, 6,000 Kelvin, 3,000 Kelvin. Here, what I've shown you in this plot, the black curve is actually a plot of the sun's spectrum, right? So you can see that the, the this, whatever, the magenta curve which you have is a black body spectrum for 5,800 Kelvin, right? So you can see that the sun's curve kind of approximates this black body curve, which you can see. There are obviously extra emission lines as well as absorption lines. So look at this spectrum closely. If there are there is extra light coming at certain wavelengths, these are what we'd call emission lines. That means you have some extra emission coming at particular wavelengths. You could have some uh, wavelengths at which you have a cutoff of light, a lack of light. These are absorption lines, right? So for the sun's curve, you have absorption lines and emission lines. And kindly note that these are coming from different layers of the sun, right? Not all of them are from the same part of the sun because there is a, a gradation in the temperature of the sun from different regions, right? And therefore, different regions will contribute to different spectral properties of the sun, right? So this is the combined curve which we have for the sun. But the absorption lines and the emission lines, etc., and different lines may be coming from a different part of the sun. Now, using this, if you actually compare this to this, you can actually see that the sun's curve approximates, approximates to a certain extent a black body curve at 5,800 Kelvin. So I can say that the temperature of the sun's, note this is the photosphere. This is not the core of the sun. The photosphere of the sun has a temperature of 5,800 degrees. So this is my photospheric temperature, which we are talking about. We are not talking about the core temperature. So that is the temperature of the sun, which I get from this by comparing it to a black body spectrum. So I'll repeat, how do we actually get the temperature of the sun or for any star? We compare it to a black body radiator and we get this. Now the spectrum has a lot more information in it. That is, you can actually see these emission lines and absorption lines, right? And uh, you know that these for characteristic, uh, for elements that are characteristic wavelengths at which you will have absorption as well as emission lines. And therefore, you can actually use that to find the chemical composition also of a given star by measuring the wavelengths at which you have emission as well as absorption lines. You can also get the abundance, that is, how much of that element is present over there, depending upon how does it compare to the continuum. Right? You actually measure how much is this depth, how deep is this depth, or how uh, high is this peak, and you can get what is called the abundance of the chemical element using the spectrum. So the spectrum actually has the maximum information you want for an object if you want. The best thing is always to get a spectrum. The problem with the spectrum is that you're taking light only in a certain wavelength, right? You're measuring light in those certain wavelengths, and therefore, uh, your telescope needs to be very good, a very large telescope to get a good spectrum. If you're just doing what is called photometry, just measuring brightness, you can do that with even a moderate size telescope. But if you're doing spectrometry, spectroscopy, then you need your telescope to be very large so that you can get maximum amount of light in this thing. You see that to build this curve, you need, a, you need to collect maximum amount of photons so that you can get a nice curve over here, right? And therefore, large telescopes, if you actually go through their telescope programs also, most of the time, they are actually doing spectroscopy. So what people do is you use a medium-sized telescope to actually shortlist your targets, to actually look for good targets, and you... Uh, you uh, justify why do you think that that target is important or interesting using the data you've got from another telescope, a smaller telescope, or from some archival data. You study that object and then you say, see, there's something interesting in this object. And hence, I would like to do spectroscopy. Because with spectroscopy, like I said, your demand would be for a larger telescope. Okay, so uh, that's how you generally have it in the form of proposals also, where your proposal is based on some prior analysis you've done of that object to justify why you want to observe that object or why do you want the spectrum of a certain object, right? So here, <clears throat> again, it's kind of describing what I was talking about. I have a black body, you have a cloud of cooler gas. If you have a cloud of cooler gas, you will have some absorption lines 
because the gas may absorb some amount, some photons coming from this hot black body and give you your absorption lines, right? You could also have uh, one emission which you're getting from that object is anyway the continuous spectrum. So if you look at this line, the basic average line is the continuous spectrum, right? Then what you have is the absorption spectrum, which is the lines at which you have a lack, which would be these lines, for example. And then you could also have the, these are emission lines. These are, there's excessive radiation at some distance, which you can see over here. These peaks will be what we call the emission lines, right? So in the spectrum, one thing is to get the continuous spectrum. From that, you can get the black body temperature. And the other thing is to get the absorption, the emission lines from which you can get the chemical composition as well as the abundance in this thing, right? So based upon the temperature of the star, stars are classified into spectral classes, right? And uh, we actually classify them. Now, uh, you know that there's a certain amount of brightness which comes in different wavelengths. Flux varies with wavelengths. So ideally speaking, if you wanted a black body curve, you would need to observe at all wavelengths of the electromagnetic radiation and then combine it all together to get the bright, you know, to get a perfect black body curve, right? <clears throat> but that is obviously not possible, right? You cannot be measuring the light from a star in all wavelengths, right? And therefore, what is done, we've already spoken about this, I'm repeating, I know that, is we define what are called photometric systems. That means we define fixed wavelengths at which we measure the brightness, okay? And these wavelengths uh, are based on certain filters. These filters can have a different uh, delta lambda or a band in it, depending upon some are called the wide band filters, which have a bandwidth of 900 angstroms. You could have intermediate band, which is about 200 angstroms. You could have narrow bands, which are 30 angstroms. Now, all three of them have their own importance. For example, if you have an H alpha line, which you're trying to observe, which is at 65, 30 angstroms, so then you would have a filter at 6530 with a plus minus of 30 angstroms, right? Which is going to get your particular H alpha line. You want to check which are the H alpha emitters in a certain region of the sky, for example. So depending upon the kind of features that you are trying to observe, you will actually put these uh, filters as they are. And these are photometric systems. So there is UBV system, JHK system, different systems. Uh, next time when we start downloading data, you will see that they are given for particular wavelengths, right? So for example, for Gaia, there are Gaia filters which are used. Otherwise, the traditional ones are UBV. Uh, Tumas uses JHK data. Spitzer Herschel has other filters depending upon the wavelengths in which they operate, right? So you will have to accordingly have your photometric system or the filters in the range of wavelengths we are talking about. So here I have a plot of the UBV filter. These are historically, these were the most popular filters. These all fall in the optical range. So the U is more ultraviolet, blue sits somewhere in between, and this one is the longer wavelength, okay? The B, which actually matches with the visual, more with the visual. Right, so these have central wavelengths at 3,600, 4,400, 5,500 with a certain width, right? And uh, these were typically used a lot. Uh, they're still being used a lot. You be the filters to characterize stars because stars are giving you a good amount of radiation in the optical, okay? And uh, you can get that from this. So, uh, the, another thing which is defined for stars is what is called color. Color is the difference in brightness in two filters. So for example, the B, B, B minus V color is MB minus NV, which is the magnitude in the B filter minus the magnitude in the V filter, right? So again, we need a calibration and therefore Vega, the star Vega by definition was set to be zero uh, B minus V color by definition, right? Now, finally, we come to the HR diagram. Here I'm showing you a plot of luminosity, right? Luminosity can be converted to absolute magnitude using the formula we used, right? And here I have temperature. Like I said, temperature we get from the spectrum of the star, which is also given in terms of what we call spectral type. So the spectral type of stars starts from O, O, B, A, F, G, 
km etc and again uh, like like it is in astronomy your magnitude scale actually is an inverted scale right and so for luminosity to be a direct scale uh, magnitude scale is inverted so it goes from up to down right and similarly the temperature scale goes not from right to from uh, left to right it goes from right to left so o type stars are much hotter than m type stars right o type stars are hot so you have a temperature here of more than 25000 often 40000 degrees this is the photospheric temperature and uh, the m type stars have a temperature of about 3000 right so uh, the temperature scale goes like this magnitude scale goes like this right so both of them are inverted if you do it in terms of temperature as well as magnitude or if this would also be how it would be in terms of color right so hotter stars have a bluer color which is over here so their b minus v would be lesser lesser than 0 or something like this while a star which is red right will have a b minus v value somewhere over here right we'll do that soon and here in this plot you can see that now there are a lot of known stars for which we have actually plotted them on this diagram and you can see here the sun comes over here you have regulus sirius a you have bega you have betelgeuse you have sirius b etc and this part remember the human hr which we looked at where we saw that bulk of humans were sitting in a certain region which we called adulthood this is the where the bulk of stars sit okay and this is what is called the main sequence so the main sequence is adulthood for a star and that's the part in a star when the star is basically fusing hydrogen okay so the star is basically fusing hydrogen and it sits upon this region okay so this is what is called the main sequence or the adulthood of the star and the bulk of stars all of them sit on the main sequence the sun also is a main sequence star and all these other stars also sit over here these stars sit off them these stars are called these ones are your white dwarfs for example sirius b is a dwarf over here and these stars are our giants why they giants we'll talk about that in a minute <clears throat> so here i have plotted the hr diagram if we have luminosity versus effective temperature you have it over here and now we what do we see we see a very nice relationship between mass and luminosity we'll come to that in a minute where you'll actually see that as you're going to more luminous stars these stars are more massive right so as these sit on the main sequence it's another hr diagram which i'm just showing you using different data this is with hipparchus data and this is basically showing you the bulk of stars all sitting over here these are all main sequence stars here are giants and here are dwarfs <coughs> now another important thing which we always need to remember in astronomy is a bias you always have an observational bias right like here you are seeing that there's a larger number of giants compared to the number of dwarfs right so the white dwarf if you remember we saw sirius b lies in this region you can see that this is much lesser than this but we also need to always remember in astronomy that there's something called an observational bias right what is the observational bias you know this is negative magnitude that means this is brighter so you are going to see these objects more compared to these objects for the simple reason that these objects are bright and these objects are faint so you do not see much of these objects so if you do not see too many dwarfs and you see more giants that doesn't mean that there are more giants than dwarfs right it just means that you have an observational bias of observing more giants and simply that's because giants are brighter so they are more easy to observe so this is also something which we are going to use later on but you always need to keep in mind your observational bias you are always going to observe things which are brighter which are closer right uh, and you may miss out on other objects and it does not indicate that there are more giants than this this is just what you see more so what you are seeing also has a bias and there are ways of correcting for your bias <clears throat> so i repeat with the hr diagram here again we have luminosity and here we have temperature if you remember this was our main sequence this is what we call the giants and this is what we call super giants and we call white dwarfs now how do we actually get this thing um you can actually um 
get the once you know the luminosity remember i showed you the formula luminosity is equal to sigma 4 pi r square t power 4 so for a given star if you know its luminosity and you know its temperature you can find out its radius right so here over here i have plots for different radii right so these are stars for which you have their luminosity you have their temperature right and these are the radii right uh, please note that this t power 4 thing this is this is in a log scale right this is a log scale and hence you're getting straight lines over here right so what you actually see in this case is once you have luminosity and your temperature you're getting radius of the star right and you will see that stars in this region have a larger radius compared to stars in this region <clears throat> and that's why <clears throat> these stars are dwarfs or stars with a smaller radius while these stars are giants these are stars with a larger radius right so here are my giants and here are my dwarfs right so you can see that if you place a star correctly on the hr diagram you can immediately get the radius of that star right now <clears throat> based on the brightness we also classify stars into luminosity classes now like i told you we know this difference in sizes so these are called the super giants which are you know on the ultimate uh, on the right corner these are very big stars because you remember this is very large radius this is small radius so radius builds like this it goes from down to up right so over here what you see these are giants here are giants super giants giants main sequence and dwarfs you're going this way right so in this way you're decreasing your radius right and therefore what happens is stars are classified into luminosity classes so luminosity class one and two these are super giants then you have giants and here you have main sequence stars which are four and then dwarfs which are five <clears throat> so these are different luminosity classes why are luminosity classes important is for example if i have a given temperature for example 6000 degrees right and i want to tell you what is the luminosity of the star i need to know what luminosity class it belongs to because i draw a straight line from here depending on whichever is its luminosity class its luminosity will vary right so a same star which is 6000 degree if it's main sequence it will have one temperature if it's a super giant it will have sorry if for the same temperature if it's a super giant it will have a larger luminosity if it's a giant it will have a lesser luminosity if it's a main sequence star it will have a still lesser luminosity right so for the same temperature you're going to get different kind of luminosities of stars depending upon which luminosity class and this is all based on the formula which i showed you which was luminosity was equal to sigma 4 pi r square t power 4 and therefore you need to know uh, which luminosity class the star belongs to to actually know where it falls there also in terms of radii because we actually know now the radii of these different these things we we can actually get uh, so what we can actually see is you can actually get the um, these are different spectral types of stars right so i talk about yeah so what we actually saw in the hr diagram that stars in the upper right are large in radii stars in the lower left are small okay so this defines only the size of the star but note that knowing the size of the star does not give you the mass of the star right because the density of stars can be very different right so <clears throat> this we already spoke about that the branch of the stars the upper right is the super giants then the giants and the dwarfs temperature increases to the left luminosity increases upwards radius goes this way right so i'll repeat this thing super giants giants main sequence dwarfs you could also have red dwarfs which are these smaller stars which are sitting over here right now how do we get the mass of stars like i told you over here you would have actually said that if we know the radius of stars we can get the mass but we cannot because the density of stars varies a lot right so there's only one way in which you can actually get the mass to real accuracy is if the star belongs to a binary right if the star belongs to a binary then you can actually study the orbit of the star right you know how the star is moving and you just have to apply simple laws of newtonian gravity right where you know that the binary system is going around the center of mass and you can measure the time periods etc of those stars and you can actually use that to get the masses of stars so now what was done next was people tried to check whether there's a relationship between the mass of stars and their luminosity right luminosity you are measuring 
mass you are indirectly getting by measuring the parameters of a binary system. So what they did is they plotted mass versus luminosity, right? Now this is what looking to a straight line plot, but it's not exactly a straight line plot because this is in log scales, okay? I, last time also I reminded you, even this one is in log scales, okay? The X and Y axis are in log scales. So you're looking at a straight line. So people realize that if you actually plot in terms of log scales, then your mass luminosity actually gives you a straight this thing. So in principle, what do you know? That your main sequence in principle is a mass sequence, right? I'll tell you what I mean by a mass sequence. It's actually telling you how our mass is distributed. So let's look at our plot again. <clears throat> if you actually see, we actually saw that as luminosity increases, mass increases, right? And therefore, here you have a more luminous star. This star will be more massive. This is a less luminous star, and hence this star is less massive, right? So this is a more massive star. This is a less massive star. This is a larger size star. This is a smaller size star, right? So please keep these things clear in your mind. A brighter star, a luminous star, needn't be a hotter star, right? For example, these stars, Betelgeuse, for example, or Antares, these are very bright stars. And these are bright stars because they are giants, but they are not hot. Look at the temperature. You see the temperature is falling somewhere over here, right? 3000 degrees. So Betelgeuse and Taris being bright stars, they are not hot, right? While for example, Sirius B, Sirius B is the companion of Sirius, okay? That star is not a very bright star, right? It, uh, it was not, it was not, it was discovered only relatively recently. It's not such a bright star, but it's a hot star, okay? So you can actually see the temperature of Sirius B is pretty hot, 25 degrees, but 25,000 degrees, but it is not bright, right? Again, it all boils down to that same old formula, which I told you, lambda, the luminosity is equal to sigma 4 pi r squared t power 4, right? And therefore, you have these dwarfs, which are hot, but not bright. And these giants, which are cold, but bright, right? So uh, one has to uh, keep oneself very clear about these concepts which we have in our mind about brightness, about mass, etc. right? So a brighter star is definitely, uh, if it's on the main sequence, a brighter star is a more massive star. So I'll, I'll go back to this, that this mass luminosity relationship, which was find out, found out, is basically for main sequence stars, okay? It does not apply to giants, for example. So for example, if Betelgeuse is very bright, it does not give you, a, it, it does not fall in this listing because it, it, this is specifically a relationship for main sequence stars. Now, uh, can somebody think and tell me, why do you think this relationship is only for main sequence stars and not for other stars? Yeah, let's see, I'll ask on the chat window. Can anybody tell me why do you think this uh, mass luminosity relationship is only valid for main sequence stars and not, for example, for giants or for dwarfs. Huh? Can anybody tell me? Yeah. <clears throat> So the basic reason, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gitanjali. Thanks a lot. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's because of the process involved. And what is the process? Uh, the process in main sequence stars is basically hydrogen fusion, right? And hydrogen fusion is taking place depending upon the mass of the star, the core temperature becomes hotter, right? And therefore the amount of fusion taking place will increase with the mass of the star because if the star is more massive, the core has a higher temperature, it will more effectively fuse hydrogen and give you much more brightness, right? But if you then going into the giant, for example, in a giant, there is different kind of fusion processes taking place, right? And therefore, and that fusion is in different shells or different layers of the star. And therefore you cannot get this kind of a correspondence of the mass and luminosity of stars. So it is only happening for main sequence because it is of the nuclear fusion, the hydrogen fusion, which is happening. 
because this is basically related only to the hydrogen fusion. That's what's happening in main sequence. Once you hear the word main sequence, you should think about hydrogen fusion, right? When you have giants, etc., then you're no longer talking about hydrogen fusion. You're talking about fusion of heavier elements, right? So then the deal becomes kind of different, right? The processes which are involved is kind of different, right? So, uh, so if you, uh, one minute, I'll just get this here. Uh, yeah, so I'm so okay. Yeah, so that is why this mass luminosity luminosity relationship applies essentially in the main sequence. So it's diagonally coming in this way. Size relationship applies over here, right? So this is the simplistic HR diagram, which simply tells you what is there in the HR diagram. Luminosity versus temperature, right? This is your luminosity versus temperature. And it directly gives you the mass. If you go this way, it directly gives you the size if it goes this way. Right. And therefore, all the information you want about the star comes to you directly from the HR diagram. That means you will know the mass of the star, you know the size of the star, you know its luminosity, you know its surface temperature. Right. Today, we are not talking about stellar evolution, or maybe I may cover it a little bit. Let me just see. But essentially, what happens is once you place a star on the HR diagram, then everything about the star becomes known to you. For example, you know whether the star is a main sequence star or whether it's a giant or it's a dwarf. And once you know that, you know in what stage of evolution is the star, right? So, uh, which actually tells you in principle the age of the star, because you know that the star is a main sequence star of so-and-so mass, and hence you can estimate its age, for example, right? So, uh, HR diagram is the holy grail for stars. That is, if you can place a star on the HR diagram, then you know all the parameters you want to know about that star. And that is what makes the HR diagram very, very important, okay? Because it is, you know, the holy grail. It actually tells you all that you need to know about a star. So the whole deal is, how can you place a star on the HR diagram? Like I said, you need to have an estimate of luminosity, you need to have an estimator of temperature. So one way is done with photometry. That is, you measure the brightness in one filter, which is your luminosity. And the temperature is a function of color. So you measure the brightness in two filters. So next time when we talk about Gaia data, you will see that Gaia has two filters. And two filters is essentially uh, necessary so that you get the temperature of a star. Gaia had a data release one. And in Gaia data release one, there wasn't two filters. There was only one filter data. So in that, you could not do an HR diagram in that way because you did not have two filters. So either you had to match it to some other catalog and then get the color by taking, say, the difference in brightness in, of the star in some other catalog minus the one in, for example, the Gaia filter, right? But the DR2 actually has it in two filters which is very important, which will give you your surface temperature. The other very important factor which you need for the HR diagram is the information about the distance, right? You need to know the distance of the star so that you can convert it to um, absolute magnitudes, right? Because the HR diagram is in absolute magnitudes. I think and I hope I have spoken to you all about extinction. Extinction is also a very important factor which we need to do when we place things on an HR diagram. Right. So here what I'm showing you is I'm showing you different stars in the, on the HR diagram on this thing. So like I told you, once you place a star, for example, if I place Betelgeuse on the HR diagram, right, I can immediately tell you what is the radius of Betelgeuse. I can tell you its parameters and see what is, uh, you know, what is where. I already set this thing. So you can get, if it is on the main sequence, then you can get its mass. You will, otherwise you will not get the mass. And otherwise you will anyway get the radius for all stars. <clears throat> now, uh, I think I have a little time, so I will just do a little bit more. So um, let's go on to star formation, right? We know that stars are born in giant molecular clouds, 
right? And these clouds are basically cold and dense, basically made up of hydrogen and helium. And what you basically have is you just have gravitational force, which dominates due to which, see there are two forces. One is the gas pressure, one is the gravity. And if the, the, the mass, uh, the cloud is a low mass cloud, then what happens is gravity is less and the pressure is more. So the pressure wins and the cloud expands. But if the cloud is high mass, then the gravity is more, pressure is less, and therefore the cloud can collapse. Now, um, I won't go into these details. You'll be able to find this on the net. Uh, these are things of what was called Jean's mass. Now, when the question came about how stars actually form, people had various theories as to how stars form. And Jean's, it was really his genius to actually think of that stars are, you know, everywhere, ubiquitous. So you want to have a force which is present everywhere, which can actually produce stars. And he, this thing that that force was gravity, right? Gravity is there everywhere. It can cause it. So actually, genes derived a formula, which was a formula, which is the, the mass of a cloud, so that the cloud can collapse under its own weight, right? Uh, I won't go into the details of that, but uh, you can see but this is very important for you to know that because you need this large mass for the cloud to collapse, right? Therefore, this is the process, right? You have this large cl cloud which collapses in its own gravitational force, which forms fragments, which then further on form the stars, right? And therefore, this basically tells us that stars therefore have to form in groups, right? Because you can't have an individual cloud which will have that much of uh, uh, you know, the parameters to actually cause the genes collapse. You want a massive one. So the cloud should be at least 10 power 3, 10 power 4 times the mass of the sun, right? And therefore, we know that stars are not born in isolation. They're born in groups and all field stars. This is also an interesting point that the star also probably formed in some cluster, right? But it's already 4.5 billion years old. So it has already dispersed from its original cluster. And we do not know the siblings of the sun. <clears throat> So then when they are formed on the HR diagram, if you were to plot stars, young stars, while they were formed, they if they are low mass stars, they actually fall like this, right? They fall vertically downwards on the main sequence. I'm not covering the equations and the stuff, but you can actually find it in books as to how do you get these Hayashi and Henry tracks. These are the tracks of stars while they are forming. So they, this is before they reach the main sequence. Once they reach the main sequence, when it is zero age main sequence, and it just sits on the main sequence, that's when you say that the star is born. When is the star born? The star is born when it starts fusing hydrogen, right? So till then, it actually comes in this way on these Hayashi or Henier tracks till it comes on to this zero age main sequence. So these are called pre-main sequence tracks. <clears throat> Again, this is important because if you plot your HR diagram, right? and you actually have all the stars corrected for their distance, etc. The presence of stars in these regions actually shows them that they are pre-main sequence stars. That means these are young stars which have not yet come onto the main sequence, right? So we, we spoke about giants and we spoke about dwarfs, but these are pre-main sequence stars. So these are stars which are yet to form. <laughs> so typically, if you're studying a star forming region, you could have stars sitting in this region and they would be the ones which are forming. What is interesting for you to notice in this is you have marks over here for 0 0.512, etc. These are the masses, right? So there are theoretically calculated tracks for remain sequence stars. And you can actually use that to determine the masses of these pre-main sequence stars. So if you actually know uh, that a star is correctly sitting on the HR diagram at a particular location, you can actually fit it to these curves to actually determine masses of pre-main sequence stars. Now, what do stars basically do most of their life? They are basically converting hydrogen to helium, right? So the core is there where you're converting hydrogen to helium. Uh, the protect, pr production is basically the proton-proton chain. So you start off with four protons, you end up with a helium nucleus, you have a mass defect, and the difference is going to give you your binding energy, right? You can have other fusion. So 90% 90 of the uh, fusion in the sun is this proton-proton reaction. But other than that, you could also have a CNO cycle, you could have a triple alpha burning, 
you could have a carbon burning you can have all of them but it also it they are basically temperature dependent right so depending on the temperature in the sun or in whichever star you will have a different contribution by different nuclear fusion reactions right so based on the 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 mass of a star there's a certain period that the star can live or that the star can take to burn its hydrogen note this thing is actually showing you that a more massive star if it's 40 times the mass of the sun it lives only a million years 10 past 6 years but if it is 0.5 m sun it lives for 2 into 10 past 12 years right so why does this happen this basically happens because what i was talking to you about that the different fusion reactions basically depend upon the temperature and the core of the star right so if the star is very massive its core temperature is very high and it more efficiently burns its hydrogen using various nuclear processes but if it is less massive it inefficiently burns its hydrogen and therefore a low mass star lives longer than a high mass star a high mass star dies down very fast and therefore looking for high mass stars in a though high mass stars are going to be brighter because they are more luminous the problem is that their lifetimes are much shorter so you can see that a star which is for example 40 times the mass of the sun it is Thousand <clears throat> times more than thousand times its age is going to be more than thousand times lesser than that of the age of the sun, and therefore, if you actually have to search for massive stars, it is not very easy because their lifetimes are so short. So when you are doing your snapshot and you are just observing, the probability that you will catch high mass stars is very low. So it's actually difficult to catch high mass stars, right? Though you have the selection bias that it's brighter and you can see it, but the physical the physics in it is that it lives long or shorter so you will not see the high mass star in a sample so easily now as these stars burn their hydrogen okay they start burning further elements and they move away from the main sequence what do i mean by away from the main sequence you're moving rightwards rightwards means you're moving cooler the star is becoming cooler but because it's becoming cooler the star expands its radius becomes larger right so here your star is expanding right and the star becomes cooler right and this is the giant region so giants are cooler but they are brighter right and the star moves to this region right so this is the giant region and with different stars depending upon their mass you will have different amount of nuclear reactions for example if you started off with a pure hydrogen star first you will fuse it to form helium then depending upon how massive the star is if the star is, it will further get you heavier and heavier elements in its core right but and you could actually have shells different regions in the star which are burning different elements right and uh, you will have it this but this is for example you can see this is the center of a 25 m sun star so if the star is not very massive even the sun itself the sun will just stop with carbon burning it's not going to fuse elements heavier than that why because heavier elements will need higher temperatures and with the mass of the sun you will not get higher enough temperatures to fuse heavier than carbon and therefore you will uh, stop with carbon but if the star is more massive it will uh, fuse heavier elements right so then what happens is that the end it just fuses hydrogen no so for example let's look at the sun the sun started off as a protostar then it will become in 4.5 billion years it become a red giant it's going to expand right and as the expansion continues this outer shell will be lost and what will be left will be inside which will be the white dwarf which is the basic core and the rest of it would all be lost okay so this would happen after 4.5 billion years now if we were to plot the evolution of the sun you will see something like this this is the main sequence the sun will move to the right it will become a giant and <clears throat> then what will actually happen is the giant will then throw out its outer layers and then become what is called a planetary nebula which i had over here where the outer uh, layers kind of separate from the core and then you'll move towards this region where it becomes a white dwarf so actually here is my main sequence so this is starting off with the proto sun a pre main sequence star which came in like this sat so sits on the main sequence goes like this becomes a giant after it becomes a giant it forms the planetary nebula 
and then it fades off and here you have the core sitting over here right so this is a picture schematic of the evolution of the sun so planetary nebulae actually observe we actually do see planetary nebulae unfortunately the name was given planetary nebulae because this was it was thought that this is where you have planetary systems forming but obviously you can see that the planetary nebula has got nothing to do with a planetary system forming it is basically just the outer shells of a dying star right but this is the uh, the kind of image with laplace amongst the earliest theories of formation of the solar system was that the star has this disk around it around which you're forming stars which is kind of true we know that stars when they are young they do have these protoplanetary disks where stars are forming but planetary nebulae are not that uh, you actually observe protoplanetary disks right you can check out images of alma etc where you can actually see protoplanetary disks with planet formation this is not planet formation this is later stages of a star right planetary nebula if the star so the, the sun will end like this but if the star is much more heavier then what it would do if it's about say 8 or 10 times the mass of the sun the separation of the outer envelope from the core is a very energetic process right and therefore what actually happens is you will have something which is called a supernova okay where the supernova goes out and the shell is left inside and that's a very massive uh, thing they are rare but if it takes place then it is very it's it's bright as a whole galaxy you have a lot it's, it's a very bright object and another important point which you need to know is that like we spoke about nuclear fusion nuclear fusion in stars stops at iron okay after that if you want to fuse you actually have to provide energy the the uh, the process is not an exothermic process it's an endothermic process in the sense you need to provide energy so that the star fuses heavier elements right and therefore over height over iron the star, star stops fusing now when a supernova takes place you have this excess energy available and that is when elements heavier than iron get fused and therefore all elements which have an atomic number larger than 56 they would have take they would have formed in some such energetic event in which you had this excessive energy in which we are this thing and uh, <clears throat> back again to this the famous statement made by carl sagan which says we are star stuff is that basically uh, the universe is basically made of hydrogen helium right and all the elements in us which are we do have hydrogen in us we have a lot of water in us but there's a lot of carbon there's calcium there's you know other elements too and all of them are elements which we have to have got fused in some star right which actually makes us star stuff because all these elements actually got fused in a star right so if you can see over here in this plot you can see that uh, till here fusion reactions release energy here fusion fission reactants release energy so here 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 beyond this we actually need to uh, provide energy right but all the elements which we have in us were actually fused in some star so if you compare the composition of the universe with our composition you can see that all these elements the human hydrogen contribution is only 9% compared to that of the universe and uh, what you can see is all these other elements obviously got fused in some star <clears throat> you can actually plot a periodic table of how different stellar processes can actually form different uh, elements we don't have the time today but you can actually you can find this on the net and you can actually see this which is actually uh, uh, explaining how different elements are formed because of uh, different processes taking place um okay we also had to speak about if you had that supernova taking place then the core which is left inside is what is called a pulsar and that's what sushan was talking to you all about and that's a typical animation of a pulsar which has a very high magnetic field and uh, therefore you only see the light coming to you in the form of pulses when the beam faces you right so that's a pulsar uh Okay, I won't talk about the Chandrasekhar limit, but I'd also say that black holes. Uh, so, if if the star is even more uh, massive, right? So we said that star pulsar. But if the star is even more massive, then the core continues collapsing and forms what is called a black hole, right? And 
like I said, like we this thing that galaxies have supermassive black holes at their centers. If you, uh, you all must be aware of the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics that was given this year for supermassive black holes in galaxies. So Penrose got it for the mathematical formulation, but uh, Ginzel and Gez, they actually did observations of the black hole, which is there at the center of our galaxy. Please have a look at, uh, there are a lot of uh, lectures available on the net on the Nobel Prize, this year's Nobel Prize on supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. And it's very interesting to actually see how did they observe and how did they estimate the mass of the uh, black hole at the center of our galaxy. So please have a look at that. And uh, I'll wind up with this. I'm not gonna do more. I think I've packed in too much today on uh, just a schematic of the birth and death of stars. So we, we spoke about this, you have a collapsing cloud gravitational collapse, you form a new star, the star evolves, moves from the main sequence, becomes a giant. Depending upon the mass of the star, if it's a sun-like star, it will be a white dwarf and a planetary nebula. If it's a more massive star, it can form a supernova. It's even more massive, it can form a black hole, right? So that's the schematic of the birth and death of stars. And I think I've packed enough, so I will not talk about these things. So I'll wind up over here. And uh, please ask me whatever questions you have on the chat window and uh, wherever. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any questions? Please put them on the chat window. Hello. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions as of now. I think you're all tired. Oh, God. Uh, we had to do uh, some amount of this theory because next time when I uh, do the other part, I will need you all to know all these concepts well, right? Because we'll be directly plotting HRs, etc. cetera. So, uh, yeah. Can we infer about the depth of layers in the sun from emission? Yes, we actually do that. So that's actually done. Uh, <clears throat> so it basically, if you are, uh, when you're observing, if you can observe, uh, we can actually get it. So if you all heard about the story about phosphine on Venus, right? So they actually got the height of the atmosphere at which they say the phosphine is there, which is 50 kilometers from the height, from the, uh, what do you say, from the base, right? So you can actually get it at which height you got it. Yes. So as God, that's right. You can get the depth and you can find the region. But for example, if you're doing it for a particular object, your telescope should give you that kind of resolution. Right. So, for example, if you're looking at a particular part of, uh, for example, Venus itself, right? Again, the Venus example with JCMT, they could not resolve different layers of Venus. Okay. They could just get the combined spectrum of Venus, right? But with ALMA, with ALMA, they could resolve. And therefore, if you actually see that paper, you'll see that they actually have the spectrum for different layers of Venus with which they could pinpoint the region from where they got the phosphine, right? So um, if you're looking at a particular object, you will need to have that kind of resolution that you know you are looking at which part, right? Giving you the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. So more questions? I don't see any more questions. Uh, tomorrow we'll have the first talk by, uh, which would be by one of the participants itself, like I told you on stellar occultations. They've been doing some work on stellar occult occultations, Shishi Deshmukh, and he'll give a short half an hour presentation on that. After that, we'll have um, astrostatistics by Najam sir. He will be doing that. He'll be doing two, three sessions on astrostatistics. Right. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so we can wind up then. And uh, 
Do I see any more questions? Uh, let's stop. Okay, fine. So thank you very much. We'll wind up now. Yeah. Thank you.